My name is Adam Berger. For those of you who don't know me, I direct the Institute of Medicine's Roundtable on Translating Genomic-Based Research for Health. I assume David just got up here. Uh, it's been a great morning and, and certainly has helped set the uh, tone for this session, I think. I, I really appreciated uh, Dan Wattendorf's comment about intuitive versus rational decision-making, because I, I think it somewhat sums our uh, evidence conundrum up nicely at this point. Uh, and just to set the session stage a bit, uh, we, we've heard in the past, and, and part of what we're trying to do is, is go forward from where we've left off other conversations, as Sharon was mentioning this morning. You know, we've, we've heard providers express that they need, uh, you know, evidence to adopt genomic technologies, uh, and that evidence is of clinical benefit. Uh, you know, Norm Kahn actually said, uh, and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget, uh, that sometimes once a test is done, the question still remains unanswered. And, and I think that really says something about what we have out there today. Uh, Pairs, we heard Reed go ahead and say the same thing this morning as well. Uh, patients want tests that's developed based on what will facilitate their best outcome. Uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, as, as Mark rightly pointed out, this really sets the background for everything we're talking about today is that patient benefit is the focal point for all of the testing that we're actually developing. Now, what this says to me is that we've actually hit a good point. Uh, it seems like everyone uh, is agreed upon the need for good evidence, so it means we can go home right now. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I think that's, on, uh, that's not going to happen, because uh, the problem is that there's not agreement on what that evidence needs to be. And I think that's why this panel is actually here today. You know, Reed actually put up a slide this morning that stated that it's only a minority of the 1,000 to 1,300 of the tests, new and, and more complex tests, have clinical utility. Um, and we also heard that we don't actually have agreement on what clinical grade genome sequence is. You know, these are all comments from this morning. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of dichotomy among different stakeholders in terms of what they need in, in order to advance. Uh, on the other side, you know, there's also constraints. You know, there's cost, time, you know, low reimbursement levels for these tests. So there's, there's a great many issues swirling around and, and what we really need to find is some type of convergence point. And, and really, I think that's kind of the idea of, of what this session is going to be, is how do we achieve convergence around the type of evidence that will be acceptable by different stakeholders? You know, what is acceptable to move a test forward? What are the incentives that are needed to shift the paradigm? Uh, and how do we develop evidence? You know, this is based on some of what I think Len was actually referring to earlier in his talk. How do we develop evidence that's actually going to be applicable to different populations? And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our speakers. Uh, I think you all have all of their biographies. I think the only one that uh, you don't have is Amar, who's replacing uh, two of our speakers here on the panel today, Pat Tverka <laughs> and Stan Lapidus. So I, I, we appreciate his uh, covering for this on short notice. Uh, and the only, I think the only addition was that Rogers uh, still lists them at MCW. So I'll just update him to be the University of South Florida. But uh, we'll just go ahead and start with Sue Friedman. Hi, I'm Sue Friedman from FORCE. And, um, my experience comes from the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer community and BRCA, so that's what I'm going to speak on um, because I don't really have formal training, but just the experience of 13 years of advocacy and watching the evidence unfold with regard to BRCA testing and still trying to wrap my head around the array of different diseases and how BRCA may or may not apply to them. Um, so I know some of the questions were, what do we need to answer? pre-market and what can wait till post-market, and I don't think I have any answers, um, but I just wanted to relate what I've observed and, you know, see if it can generate more um, thought from smarter minds than mine <laughs> to come up with some answers. Um, so BRCA testing, I'm sure most of you know, was introduced commercially in 1996, and at the time there really wasn't much outcome data. There was certainly no prospective clinical trials, and yet people started making decisions right away based on that from my experience. And 14 years later, um, in 2010, we got our first um, study, prospective study that showed that there was a survival benefit for women who had genetic testing and then went ahead and remove their ovary. So um, actually, listening to one of the other panelists in the last session, I, you know, I thought 14 years was a long time to derive that post-market information when the test had been out for, for that long. But it sounds like um, other tests sometimes take even longer than that. Um, and, you know, what are the important outcomes and endpoints? Is survival the only endpoint that we um, really care about? And, you know, maybe for a predictive tests like BRCA, it's not. But there are advocacy groups and stakeholders who believe that is the best, um, best outcome to look at. And, you know, there are still groups that say that genetic testing should only be done in a clinical trial setting. Um, so I think 
I think these are important things for us to consider. Um, it may have been obvious at the time that PRCA testing was developed that um, prophylactic surgery might improve outcome, but we don't, I mean, we don't really know about the survival data. There's, you know, secondary issues like heart disease um, from early menopause and, you know, other, um, other later down the road um, diseases and issues that can come up, and we don't really know about the long-term outcomes for that community. I mean, we're only like 14 years into it. Um, but I think it's also important to ask the question, what are people doing in the absence of the test and in the absence of data? So before BRCA testing, I mean, it was mostly family history and those people who had a family history and didn't have um, access to genetic testing might have chosen interventions that once BRCA testing came about and they were able to determine they had true negative, they, they could make better decision making. So maybe we don't have to wait for long-term outcomes to benefit people who end up with true negative tests for a predictive test. Um, so I think those are kind of the important things to look at, again, in, in the context of BRCA. Um, some other issues that came up, I still think consumers are not, they, they don't have the numeracy to always understand. I mean, without being patronizing, they don't always understand what the data, what, what developing clinical data means. I mean, they assume when a test is on the market that it, the utility of it has already been proven, that, um, that it has FDA approval, um, and that it will help them with decision making. And so, you know, I, again, um, I think it's really important that we engage stakeholders at every level, and especially consumer stakeholders, but how are we going to get them to a level where they can understand what is and is not known about these tests. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and end my comments. Great. Thank you. Uh, go over to Roger Klein. All right. Um, so, so I'm approaching this from a, a somewhat different uh, vantage point that a, a really a, p a practicing molecular pathologist uh, who, who performs uh, these uh, diagnostic procedures and, and really spends much, much of my time um, advising uh, um, uh, my treating uh, physician colleagues on how to use tests and um, and how to interpret them uh, for the benefit of our, our patients. Um, and, and so what I'm looking at are, are what are the evidence standards I need to be able to recommend a test, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to help interpret it and to, pay, to play an important role uh, in the patient care team. And so the, uh, the, the, first thing I, the, the first thing I would point out is that the evidence standards that we set are, are going to be extremely important for uh, in, in guiding the introduction or translation of molecular genetic discoveries into clinical medical practice. And so as Dr. Tuxton said, it's very important that we get it right. Um, if, if, we're, if we're too stringent, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll inhibit uh, uh, progress, if, uh, but if we're not stringent enough, we'll, we'll hurt patients. So we, we need to, we need to, to get it right. Um, and, and so from that standpoint, I would say that this, the desirable characteristics of evidence um, for, for most of these procedures shouldn't differ from, from the standards that we use for, uh, for other medical diagnostic procedures. So we, when we look at a quote test, we should analyze it the same way we analyze other medical interventions. Um, uh, uh, what we're really looking at, uh, what we're really looking at here um, we're trying to assess the benefits or possible benefits uh, for a patient against the harms or possible harms. And that, that's really the framework within which these decisions are made. We look at evidence that, that tries to, uh, that, allow, that, that we want to allow us to, to weigh benefits and harms. And, and then you, you come up with sort of a, uh, a recommendation, and then that recommendation is going to be based on evidence. It's sort of like a weatherman. Um, uh, uh, I, I just saw this, uh, this in an article where there's a 40% chance of rain tomorrow and a 10% chance we know what we're talking about. So that, that's, that the 10% the, the, uh, the, the is, you know, is, is the quality of the evidence, and we need, we need to look at it. Um, so molecular pathology, I'll use that term otherwise known as genetic genomic tests, that do, uh, is really 
a very, very heterogene heterogeneous uh, group of, uh, uh, of uh, procedures um, used for diagnosis, uh, used for prognosis, risk of disease, that would tend to be more the inherited genetic tests, um, uh, but m disease monitoring, for example, BCR ABLE, or, or prediction of responsiveness to, uh, to therapy. And, and the evidence requirements that we, we set are going to depend on the use, the context, and alternative procedures. In, in other words, I think it's going to be hard to set universal standards of evidence uh, uh, that, are, that are going to be um, uh, applicable to, to to every procedure, much less every every uh, 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 patient situation. Um, some of the uh, some of the given that the approach needs to be the same as with other other diagnostic procedures, uh, I think uh, some of the the uh, the unique issues are um, first of all the the extraordinary volume of new discoveries. Um, in in uh, in the field of genomics, uh, uh, molecular pathology, where the the information is actually overwhelming, whether it comes from from GWAS studies or um, or, or now next generation uh, sequencing techniques, the enormous statistical and bioinformatics challenges are being presented, and these are well beyond the the capabilities of even uh, the brightest uh, of physicians and doctoral scientists who are involved in in in, uh, in these uh, these procedures. Um, and 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 it's it's something that uh, that that uh, is now requiring a, a much greater teamwork um, on the part of participants. Um, again, that that the you know DNA and RNA based testing is is extremely heterogeneous, uh, uh, both in meth in terms of me the methodologies used, the specimen types, um, and, and 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 these tests are, are or procedures are wide ranging in in clinical application. So again, this this. Um, the, this makes it very hard to to uh, to make general statements. Uh, 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 Dan uh, alluded to that. Uh, Wattendorf. Sometimes I don't know what what people are really talking about. Uh, that's understandable. You know, the, the inherited people sitting over here are talking about uh, about BRCA, and the and the tumor people are sitting over here, and they're talking about KRAS, and and then somebody else is talking about Oncotype DX. So we, we don't. Uh, yeah, we're not always on the same uh, on the same page. Um, uh, 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 one important thing to consider about any diagnostic procedure is that typically, not always, but typically it's, it's used as part of a larger uh, evaluative uh, or evaluative and management process, and, and so it's 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 hard to tease out the evidence attributable or the the impact the outcomes in, impact attributable to uh, an individual uh, uh, component of of that uh, of that larger piece, um, and so it, as it turns out, there first of all there isn't a lot of funding for for. Uh, for for studies, um, th this point has been mentioned uh, uh, earlier. But I, I had a slide. I, I somehow I missed the part about not having slides. So I had a slide that Moyne Curry gave me, and it showed that you know the, this enormous exponential drop off in the number of papers uh, uh, published. Uh, from discovery and, and research phase into the cl into clinical practice, and, and 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 there just isn't a lot of uh, money or reward actually for uh, for for finding out how well um, uh, some of these uh, uh, methodologies function uh, in in practice, and and so as a result, when one looks at evidence, what what we find is that available studies typically are limited in size, uh, number, scope. Um, and the study subjects often differ in, in their disease courses and presentation. Um, now, for, for inherited disease, look, most of these are not common. Since they're not common, we don't have studies. It, you don't have enough patients to do studies. People set up registries, um, and, and if, you know, if a given disease is large enough, we can acquire that type of data. But, but in general, we, we have to use a lot of reasoning. Um, you, do a, you look at, for example, germline DNA. You look at a gene. You look and see if you at something that you know is caused by a knockout of a gene, and you see that there's a truncating mutation. Well, you sort of assume that that's probably a disease-causing uh, a mutation in a patient with a phenotype, but a lot of times it's not that easy, and uh, and, and we sure don't uh, we sure don't uh, there, there's a lot that we uh, we don't know. Um, uh, the, 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 most of you probably know this, but I mean, what, basically, what we're looking at when we're looking at analyzing really any diagnostic is is the analytical validity. Um, how accurate is it? 
How reliable is it in, de in, in actually detecting what we're looking at? Um, and then we move on to, you, you know, it, it's interesting because there, there, there actually isn't, there, there isn't a lot of data often on analytical validity. And we, when, when we look at things from an evidence standpoint, we, we sort of assume um, uh, with probably decent justification that, 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 that analytical results are accurate. And I think, I think there, there's wide experience with mo mo the application of molecular biologic techniques, even uh, if not so much in, in this specific uh, uh, setting. Um, and there are uh, regulatory uh, uh, frameworks, uh, uh, both uh, um, uh, through the CLIA process and then accreditation uh, uh, by deemed agencies like our friends at the College of American Pathologists, who, who do monitor these. And I think I think we can, you know, we can we can feel confident most of the time that analytical uh, validity um, is uh, is there. It should be if people if people. Uh, uh, um, know what uh, you know if people are making effort and know what they're doing that the techniques are can are quite powerful but uh, but again there isn't a lot of evidence uh, in the published literature often uh, on specific procedures and and when one starts to get into complicated specimen types and and, and other situations uh, it can be uh, trickier um, clinic okay okay the other the other uh, two pieces are clinical validity um, uh, clinical validity uh, is really the accur accuracy and reliability in predicting uh, the phenotype or disorder. If you don't have analytical validity and you don't have clinical validity, which, you know, the relationship between a biomarker and a disease or, or a phenotype you're looking at, if you don't have those two things, forget it. It's, they, these should be prerequisites. Clinical utility is very hard to establish. That is actually evidence of improved health outcomes. And it's hard to establish, again, because we don't have a lot of data. It's, you know, the, the, the procedure tends to be part of a wider uh, milieu of healthcare management or diagnosis, and and it's hard to um, it's really hard to get at that that data. Um, so finally, I, what I'll, I'll close with um, with a, the, uh, an article that I found very interesting in um, in the New England Journal of Medicine this week, um, and it involved a, a, a group of researchers who who went and sequenced using next generation techniques uh, uh, tumors, uh, uh, different tumors, uh, kidney tumors from four uh, four separate patients, and found different results depending upon the part of the tumor that they took. And and I'll, I'll just uh, read the the quotes I, because it's it's so important. That we that we really understand what we're doing here before rushing uh, rushing uh, procedures and right. techniques. Okay. Okay. I'll give you ten seconds. Ten seconds. All right. Um, well, I'll give you the the accompanying editorial quote. Um, uh, the, sim the simple view of directing therapy on the basis of genetic tumor markers is probably too simple. Thank you very much, Roger. Appreciate Sorry. that. No, no problem. Uh, part of my job is timekeeping, so I'll also be uh, letting you guys know when we're getting close. Uh, David Clifford from uh, uh, Patients Like Me. Thanks. Uh, my name is Dave Clifford. I'm from Patients Like Me. We were mentioned during the last talk. Uh, we're a data platform for patient reported outcomes. So if you come to us and you have a disease, and we'll ask you a battery of questions about the disease that you have, and you can build a longitudinal profile over time. And we can use that to start discriminating, not in a bad way, in a statistical way, discriminating between people of different phenotypes, um, and then ideally doing interesting research on those cohorts of individuals. Um, we're looking at doing some of our initial biomarker studies in those cohorts probably in the next year, year and a half. Um, but I want to talk about what patients do and sort of why they do it. So when we look at um, what patients expect, I'm going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to talk about expectations, information. My colleague talked about evidence development, so I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to talk about ownership of data. So what does a patient expect? A patient expects that they can behave irrationally with regards to their health because they're sick and they're in crisis of some sort, and that everyone else will behave rationally. What do I mean by that? I mean that the expectation of a given patient is that when a blood test is drawn from them and they have been diagnosed with a condition, that information from that genetic test is used for the purposes of making every other patient who has that test in the future better. This is most likely a majority opinion of patients. They've done some work in Great Britain on a patient attitude towards research. And there, patients expect that the information that they get tested on is essentially contributing to a larger research framework. And this is not true at all. So we talk about this sort of learning healthcare system. 
And the expectation of the patients is that the learning healthcare system has already been built, that all of the information from their care is of high scientific quality, is used to generate future research portfolios, and that they don't have to consent to be part of that research because they're already part of research. Uh, this isn't the case. What this is the case is that you get an ICD-10 code, and it's a billing code, and that's most patient-generated information, and that's what's used as research strata. So if patient expectations are that all, they're all part of research already, what sort of information can we ask them to contribute on a normal basis if they're kind of sick or mostly, si or mostly well? And I think not much. Even in cases where we have very clinically ill people, people who have been affected by seriously debilitating conditions, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, Parkinson's, and ALS, the conditions that we're good at currently, um, patients generally come to get information resolved or to get questions resolved, and they don't engage in providing data to a research system over time. And you know, you really need to give patients something useful if you have an expectation that they're going to do anything. Um, in this context, I think in the, in the genetic context, um, what is most useful to people isn't just a risk number, but it's actually contextual information. It's, I've got this test done, so what? What does that mean against other people who have had a similar procedure done? How can I contact someone that has this procedure done and give meaning to it? Um, you know, we talk about genetic counselors and the inability to access genetic counseling services with high fidelity. Um, I think that beyond that, there's another step where patients really want to connect with people who have a similar disease to them and get more of that social sort of support. But this relies on, I think, looking at the model of ownership of that data. And you know, one of the things that I advocate for, that we advocate for, um, is allowing patients, so my colleague mentioned, a patient who receives the findings from a test wants to feel that those findings are reasonably confident. I think, I'd, I don't mean to paraphrase you too much, but they, the, a, a given patient wants to be confident in their findings and that we should be sure that any test that we conduct on a patient has a high uh, statistical probability of being accurate. And I, I don't necessarily agree. I think that Patients should be told, here's how confident we are in something, here's the likelihood that it's wrong, but it's the test that we ran on you. It doesn't have to be perfect information to be high enough quality that a patient should be told about it. When a diagnostic or when a procedure is run on a patient, the patient should have ownership of the output of that test in it's the most raw form possible. And they should be allowed to do with that test what they will. And I think that that's the expect, you know, going back to the expectations that patients have, I think that you're going to find more and more people who are advocating for that level of ownership of their own data to say, pull it out of the black box and give it to me. I trust you to be able to interpret it, but I might want someone else to look at it. And that's going to be a challenge for uh, test manufacturers, for regulatory agencies, um, and for some of these direct-to-consumer individuals. Uh, those are my brief points, um, and I'll move on. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Now we're going to switch to uh, Amar uh, Kamath from Bi Bioreference Laboratory. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amar Kamath with uh, Bioreference Laboratories, and uh, it's, it's, we're a diagnostic testing company. And, and we do diagnostics in routine clinical and oncology women's health uh, as well as uh, rare diseases. Uh, so I'm not going to try to replace anyone today. I'm going to try to uh, represent the commercial view or diagnostic testing laboratory view and um, uh, with respect to evidence. And as I read this, uh, the, the question is not about the evidence itself. The question is the context for evidence. And uh, there are some issues that we have or many issues that we have uh, that we are dealing with as a commercial entity um, from a diagnostic testing side. So just a few facts to begin with. Uh, everyone talks about the $1,000 genome or $100 genome or whatever it might be. Uh, however, today's technologies, all the technologies that are being worked on do not measure all types of or identify all types of variations that can cause disease. 
uh, all the technologies that we talk about for the hundred dollar genome are sequencing technologies and the the DNA has other types of problems that can have it can have structural uh, variations deletions duplications insertions there can be repeat expansions it could be uh, triplet repeat expansions or other types of uh, variations um, and uh, those also cause disease but these technologies don't um, uh, identify those variations so just a just a point that that we should remember uh, in terms of um, the the context for evidence the issues that we are facing with uh, start with uh, probably start with regulatory issues there are so many organizations that think that they and and, and regulate the evidence for example uh, the fda regulates evidence uh, clear um, uh, every regulates evidence state departments of health regulate evidence uh, centers for disease control regulates evidence the medical societies, if you think about um, ACMG, ACOG, uh, AMA, all these societies regulate evidence. And as a commercial entity, we need to figure out which agency are we going to follow and, and which ones do we have to follow and how do we manage the, all these different conflicts of evidence where ultimately there may not be enough revenue to justify generating that much evidence. and. Ultimately, a patient and a physician have to make a decision about what am I going to do with this very specific situation, and the, the burden of evidence generation may not actually make sense ultimately for that decision. So I think that's very important. There is conflict in, and, and motivations and the incentives needed for this evidence. There is a question about um, sharing data. Um, Genetic information tends to be, for some reason, or for a good reason, uh, very sensitive. Uh, people talk about, um, I'm not going to share my genetic data. Um, I don't hear this from patients. I hear this from regulators. I hear this from, from managements of companies. Uh, and we are, in, we are in the Facebook generation. We are in the Google Plus generation, where everybody shares about what they are having for a cup of coffee this morning and everybody shares about how their children got into some kind of accident or whatever happened. So people share their most private information online and if I go onto a patient website, I can see patients sharing data openly. And I can see companies like patients like me right here where platforms are being provided for people to share data and therefore do something with it. And at the same time, we have the complete opposite view, it seems, that this is so personal, so private, that no one will ever share that data. That seems to be the assumption, and I think it's a question that's, that people need to answer. The, the conflicts that, that exist between the, the commercial entities, um, the, the competition that exists between the commercial entities, as well as the, the regulatory issues that we have to deal with. When generating evidence for, for a diagnostic test, for reason, I, I almost wish it was the, the title of this conference was Diagnostic Testing instead of Genetic Testing, because oftentimes the biggest impact, the biggest cost savings that can be done um, can be done with, with the simplest testing services. Um, we were, in our company, we are looking at um, um, looking at how can we predict illness and the question is can you predict illness and if you think about a very simple test uh, I'll give you the test of just cholesterol levels so if you do a test for lipids um, you will see that there is a normal range um, and um, and there is a high and if you look at a normal laboratory report, if you just go, go get a lipid test done, you will see that laboratory report will come back and say that this patient is above or below. That's it. If it's above, treat them. If it's below, don't treat them. What if you knew that data for the past five years? What if you knew that data for the past five years and you could see a trend towards the limit? Would you be able to intervene ahead of time? Would you like to treat them with an expensive therapy when it's beyond the, the normal limit? Or would you like to know that they're going towards that limit and treat them at that point? Or not treat them, but rather advise them in modifying their behavior, which, by the way, costs zero. So 
uh, I think the important thing is that, that for, for us to look at the, the simple things uh, that can help reduce the cost of care um, and, and probably, probably predict illness. And from a genetic testing side, it's, it's interesting that, I guess I'm going to be provocative on this statement. Um, genetic disease could probably eradicate it, if you think about it. I was in Dubai a couple of years ago attending, attending some meeting, and I met with um, um, a representative from the Ministry of Health of some sort there. And she was talking about having a program across the country where every student, as they went to college, the first day they had to give their blood for a genetic test. And uh, there was no informed consent, by the way. This was Dubai. Um, <laughs> so, um, so they wanted to work with us to do some research in, in genetics. And uh, we asked them, do you have informed consent? I was like, what's that? Was the response. So, um, so while here in the United States we, and, and, and certain parts of the world we talk about privacy and all this consent, there is completely another side where it's not happening. But the point is that their mission was to prevent genetic disease. And how do you do that? They want everyone to know what traits they carry. And if they know what traits they carry and, and they get married to someone at some point, if they know what traits they carry, then they could make a decision of what's the risk they want to take and what are follow-up actions that they could do. So, so it's interesting that if you put that mindset on, you can think about genetic disease being preventable. So um, those are just, um, just my comments. And finally, I would just like to talk about uh, funding uh, for uh, evidence generation. And um, uh, today, there is the, the money. If you think about where is the money, the just money a, is in NIH. Just a quick wrap up, though, if you don't mind. Sure. It's my last comment. Um, there's money is in NIH. The money is in pharma, device, payers, uh, companies like us. This is where all the money is. And if there was an effort, if there was a clear guidance uh, from NIH that said, in, uh, instead of funding purely based on a researcher's interest or where, is there, where there is gap in, in knowledge of medicine, we are going to fund a certain amount purely for generating evidence. That's it. And we're going to have different threshold and we're going to try to have a standard that does not conflict with all these different regulatory agencies and, and organizations. I think that would go a long way. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, and just before we start taking questions from the audience, I do want you all to please participate. So please make use of the microphones as well as uh, those who are viewing the webcast. Uh, I'll just ask a quick question first. If you don't mind, I'll take uh, moderator's prerogative. But uh, and I'll just say I'm not trying to make a political statement. I just have young kids, so my uh, movie choices these days are mostly uh, dictated around uh, cartoonish types of uh, characters. I just took them to see the Lorax, and it just occurred to me that, that here you had a situation where you had a, a final seed for a tree. My question to the group right now is. Uh, where would you plant that seed? Would it be in RCTs, observational studies, patient-developed data? Where is it that you are going to actually put your stake in the ground? I think that there's some interesting work being done now on these ideas of uh, federated structures. So the idea of creating multi-institution data sets which then act as some sort of public good. And a variety of researchers can run calls on those data um, just from research interest perspectives rather from an investigator initiated grant perspective or from a, a commercial need perspective. Um, I think that these federated systems are going to become more and more powerful over the next 10 or 15 years because I think the idea of centralized massive data sets is kind of going the way of the dinosaur as people are running into more and more barriers to creating those data sets. So I would say that if you create better SQL, SQL servers, you're probably going to do a pretty good job. I would argue that um, um, places like genetic testing registry, I think everyone here knows about the GTR. Um, the an interesting thing about GTR is that it classifies every single genetic test out there that's available to physicians and patients. So um, if there was a standard place for everyone to provide data, um, and then people can uh, replicate those. So, um, so maybe there's a registry that is a centralized patient's registry, but uh, then it is available for everyone to use. And one example is probably, I see David Ledbetter here, um, ISCA, uh, they have created a registry for uh, all, uh, tracking all structural variations that have been discovered in all laboratories. 
um, from a genetic perspective. So uh, I would argue putting money in something like that. Yeah, I, I would just say our, our technical abilities at this point uh, uh, far supersede our ability to understand uh, what to do with the data. So for so we're we're developing means of, of for example, whole, sequencing a whole genome for a thousand dollars, a hundred dollars uh, was proposed, and but we really don't understand what to do with the data. And the 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 I think the the key to the next. 50 years, 100 years, is going to be sorting out what what variants in the genome mean and how we can apply the, and use those variants to, to, to improve uh, uh, patient uh, health. That's two. I, I just want to second what was said before, that people are willing to participate and share their information, and we've seen that with our organization as well. If we provide them with the platform and the ability to connect and share their information, then um, they're probably less worried about the privacy issues than um, most everyone else in the healthcare community. And so, you know, I think we need to figure out a way to allow people to share their information. Thanks. I think Dave had a question. If he wants to go to ask, then we'll go over to Mark. I was just going to comment that, you know, the United States has a set of standards for data and data privacy. Um, but separate from that, there's the European Union, and Dubai has a set of standards, and Japan has a set of standards, and Singapore has a set of standards. But the EU um, is looking at sets of, of data frameworks that disallow an individual data owner to contribute data to a large data system, because the data system on its own uh, violate statutes. So an individual can have access to all the data that they want, but when they contribute that into a database, the database passes a certain threshold of identification of an individual among that data set, and because of the Second World War, most largely, those things violate the European ethos in biomedicine. So, you know, when we talk about ways to construct things going forward in the United States, it's always good to think about the other paradigms that are used across the Atlantic, and we don't want to, you know, leave some of our scientific colleagues there behind. We'll go to Mark. Thanks. Um, I wanted to compliment Amar on very short notice for uh, <laughs> doing that. I think that was great. And I wanted to pick up on something that you said. You talked about the context of evidence, which I think is really important. But as I particularly reflect on whole genome sequencing approaches, I think that the context of the testing for the information is also very important. In other words, if you say, well, it's economically feasible to do whole genome sequencing, and I have a person that has cancer, and so I want to see if one of the 20 cancer oncogenes is involved, it's cheaper for me to do whole genome sequencing, but then I have a bunch of other information that could come that's not related specifically to the clinical question, which we characterize as incidental or secondary findings. And in that case, the paradigm is really a screening paradigm, which means, as Roger was saying, we need a much higher predictive value uh, on that information if we don't understand what the individual's prior risk is. And so that's something that I th the, the whole, this question of context is one that has not gotten nearly enough uh, discussion. So I'm glad you brought it up from the perspective of evidence generation, but I think we also need to talk about it uh, from the perspective of why did we do the test and what information accrues. And that then relates to the point that I want to bring back to the panel. Uh, David and others have mentioned the idea that, you know, in some ways the patient makes sense as the uh, person to uh, get the results back because they are the only person that consistently appears throughout the healthcare experience. Um, so it makes some sense to do that, but I have concerns about uh, people looking at data and then making decisions that are not necessarily in their best interest or generating additional costs following up things. And we saw a little bit of this with whole uh, uh, the body CT scanning as an example where people were, were killed following up what were turned out to be incidental findings and, and Zach Kahani's talked about this in the incidental loan. How do we how do we balance that with the fact that as Reed said we don't have a uh, unlimited cost uh, ability to accept costs so and we can't really afford to have people tracking down things that they may be personally interested in but from a societal perspective may not be so interesting. Should. Go ahead. I, I think when we're talking about predictive tests, and it, like 
again, BRCA is an interesting example. Um, it's not, the penetrance isn't 100%. People are making decisions on this, and they're not making benign decisions. And, you know, I don't know much about lipid um, issues and heart disease, but I'm guessing that, you know, you might change your diet, you might exercise, and you may take medication that's been proven fairly safe. In the case of BRCA, people are making decisions. They're removing breasts. They're removing ovaries. Um, can we apply the same standard to BRCA testing that we do to other predictive testing for, for instance, breast cancer and some of those SNP tests? And are people able to tell the difference between having a high risk that, you know, maybe up to 85% lifetime risk versus, you know, 25% lifetime risk and, you know, the, that their decision making may be different based on that. And so I think all of these are part of the context and I think it makes it very complicated even within the same disease. So we are dealing with that right now. Um, we offer the whole exome sequencing now uh, and uh, we've run a bunch of tests on these whole exomes and, and you have to make a de decision or diagnosis in the context of the family. And going in, everyone has to be informed that there are going to be incidental findings and it, it cannot be taken lightly. It's a serious issue. One good thing about genetic testing is it's a once in a lifetime test. You don't keep doing it. You don't have to keep doing it. Your DNA does not change for the most part. Um, so, so from that perspective, it's important. We, I don't think we have answers. There are a lot more questions now than answers, obviously. And uh, again, it goes back to context because you got to deal with the issues of privacy and a genetic test is never private. W once you make a diagnosis, there is, there is a question of family issues. And how do you manage those issues? So um, it's absolutely true. We are dealing with that right now, and we don't have answers. Roger. Yeah, I, Mark, I, I think you made some really terrific points, and I love the part about the whole body, uh, whole, whole body uh, MRI or PET or whatever people do this, these days. But um, I think to, in, in response to what, what, what Sue said, I, I think it's really important to know what, what's your purpose in ordering a test. What are you going to do with the information? When, you, when, when a physician orders a test, he or she has something in her mind, a paradigm, uh, uh, um, a question that, 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 that's trying to be answered. And, 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 and that should determine you know, what, what, your, what your, the probable use of the test will, will set the framework or context for, for the thresholds that we need. For example, if you're going to do a test and you're going to operate on somebody on the basis of that test, well, you want to know that that evidence is good. You want to understand the evidence. Um, if, it's, if it's a test, uh, and, and so the threshold would be, for me at least, higher. Then, then, for example, if, if you're using a test that has uh, a moderate impact on, on, on a decision-making process, um, but there's evidence that it does, uh, there's, there's reasonable evidence that it, uh, it could potentially influence an outcome, and you, but you've got a whole bunch of other data. Those are very different uh, uh, settings, and, and they need to be treated differently, I think. So unfortunately, I think we're going to actually end up running out of time in this session. So I apologize to those of you who are waiting at the, uh, uh, at the microphones. Uh, but I'd like to go ahead and thank the speakers. One thing I'd just like to add, quick clarification. Uh, you mentioned just the, the once in a lifetime test, and I do want to just, uh, I think that's still up in the air today. And even you pointed out earlier, there are limitations right now to the sequencing technology. So it, that's still an unresolved situation where you would actually, whether or not we would be making it a once in a lifetime or not. Uh, there are other uh, issues that also are, are being debated right now. But I think overall, I think what we heard today is kind context really matters for, for the development of the evidence that we need and maybe some type of strategy that would be uh, enable us to develop evidence based on risk of use as well as a risk for developing that might be a good, good strategy for moving forward to help all the stakeholders come to some type of convergence around evidence. So I'd like to go ahead and thank the panelists and I'll turn it over to Sharon. Thank you. Thanks very much.